Good evening. I am glad to have the opportunity to come this evening uh, to spend time looking and considering at God's Word together with you all. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for who you are, that there is none like you, that you are, as we've just sung, holy, 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 the thrice holy one, altogether pure, altogether lovely, completely righteous in all your ways. God, we thank you that you are God and that we are not. We recognize that you created all things and by your will they exist. And God, we also acknowledge that though you created us good and righteous and sufficient to stand, we sinned as your people and we deserve death and condemnation and separation forever. Yet you in your divine plan sent your son to save a people for yourself. God, we thank you for the privilege of being among the redeemed. We thank you for redemption that is found in Christ. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins. God, we thank you for your word and the privilege that you've given us to open it up and consider it. And we pray, God, that you will help us this evening as we read it, as we consider it, as we seek to arrange our lives in light of it and apply it. We pray for help from your spirit in order that Christ might receive all honor and glory both now and forever. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, if you saw the title flying around for uh, tonight's sermon, The Kindness of Christ, Our King, I'm going to take that from Mark chapter 4. I'm going to use Mark chapter 4 as a launching point and hopefully throughout the entirety of the passage, consider the kindness of Christ as our King, but primarily culminating in the last passage of that chapter. In one sense, you might say we are looking at a day in the life of our Lord. Mark chapter 4 encapsulates the entirety of one day in the life of Jesus. So we're going to come together over the next several minutes and follow him. As if we were one of his disciples and seek to learn from him. Let's read beginning in Mark chapter 4. I'll begin with verse 1 and we'll read to the end of the chapter. Mark 4, verse 1. Jesus began to teach again by the sea, and such a very large crowd gathered to him that he got into a boat in the sea and sat down, and the whole crowd was by the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables and was saying to them in his teaching, Listen to this. Behold, the sower went out to sow. And as he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And after the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. Other seeds fell into the good soil, and as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. And he was saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. As soon as he was alone, his followers along with the twelve began asking him about the parables. And he was saying to them, to you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, pardon, but those who are outside get everything in parables. So that while seeing, they may see and not perceive. And while hearing, they may hear and not understand. Otherwise, they may return and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones who are beside the road where the word is sown. And when they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. In a similar way, these are the ones on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no firm root in themselves, but are only temporary. 
Then when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones on whom seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word. But the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And those are the ones on whom seed was sown on the good soil, and they hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. And he was saying to them, a lamp is not brought to be put under a basket, is it, or under a bed? Is it not brought to be put on the lampstand? For nothing is hidden except to be revealed, nor has anything been secret but that it would come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he was saying to them, take care what you listen to. By your standard of measure, it will be measured to you, and more will be given you besides. For whoever has, to him more shall be given, and whoever does not have, even what he has, shall be taken away from him. And he was saying, The kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. And he goes to bed at night and gets up by day, and the seed sprouts and grows. How? He himself does not know. The soil produces crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. But when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. And he said, How shall we picture the kingdom of God, or by what parable shall we present it? It's like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the soil, though it is smaller than all the seeds that are upon the soil, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and forms large branches, so that the birds of the air can nest under its shade. With many such parables, he was speaking the word to them, so far as they were able to hear it. And he did not speak to them without a parable, but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. On that day, when evening came, he said to them, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat, so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, Do you not care that we're perishing? And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? They became very much afraid and said to one another, Who then is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. Quite a day in the life of our Lord, quite a day for the disciples who are following him along from early morning. The crowd's so big, they have to push out from the shore in order that he might teach them. And you can see the theme woven throughout these parables. These are the first parables that Mark records for us here. But a strong emphasis, particularly on this first parable, on listening to the word of God, on hearing the word of God, on accepting it into our hearts in order that we might do it. Verse 3, listen to this, Jesus says. Verse 9, he he who has ears, let him hear. Again, in verse 20, those who hear the word and accept it are the ones who bear fruit. So it's worth us considering Do we have ears to hear? God expects us to. Do we have wills to listen that are willing to do? Do we have hearts to accept the truth of God's word? Do we have lives that apply this truth in every area of our lives? The idea of hearing, to hear, the expectation of us listening and hearing occurs more than a dozen times here in this chapter. Listening to the word of God is important. Listening to God is crucial. In fact, it's the prerequisite for keeping the greatest commandment. Listen to Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. We cannot keep the greatest commandment if we do not hear 
God's word, if we do not listen to him. So we see here that Jesus is teaching in parables, and we know that it was a common method that Jesus used. In fact, there are about 40 parables recorded throughout the four Gospels. But why did he use parables? If I'm honest with you, I have long thought that Jesus uses parables to make things easier for us to understand. But that is completely contradicted here in the text. Jesus actually says, I'm using parables to keep it from being easy to understand. And after reading it, we can understand that, right? I mean, would it not be more simple to just say, you know what? Some people are going to respond to the gospel this way and others are going to respond that way. But that's not what Jesus does. He uses this parable. In fact, if Jesus used parables to make things easier to understand, then Jesus is not very good at teaching with parables. Verse 10, as soon as Jesus was alone, his followers began asking him, what are you talking about? Like this story that you told back there, this lesson, you obviously have something for us to learn. Now tell us what it is because we heard what you said, but we have no idea what it means. And he says to them, do you not understand this parable? To his disciples, how will you understand all the parables? Remember, this is the first one that, that Mark records. It's as if Jesus is saying, i got a pocket full of those things. You've got to get in tune. You've got to follow with the teaching. You've got to understand. Do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all of the parables? Parables are an indirect form of teaching that Jesus is using. But here's the key. They require some level of investment. It's not putting the cookies on the bottom shelf so that everybody can get it. That's not what Jesus is doing with the parables here. The, he's not using homespun stories for lazy minds and disinterested hearts. I spent a couple years in Ethiopia almost 20 years ago. And even prior to that, closer to 25 years ago, um, went to Ethiopia for the first time for the, a summer. And I was having lots of opportunities uh, to teach and preach in different homes and churches. I probably had no business doing any of that because I'd only been a Christian about 18 months. Nonetheless, that's what I was doing. And once a week or so, I would leave the place I was staying, which was a house with 11 Ethiopians in it. I would leave and go into the city to some missionaries who would let me use their shower. So I would shower once a week or so. So I would go in and get cleaned up, have a good meal, sometimes spend the night and then go back um, with the family that was hosting me who didn't have a normal shower or any of the, any of the um, creature comforts that I had grown up with. And I was talking to them about the opportunity that I was going to have to, to teach at this um, church on the coming weekend. And what they said to me was, just tell them a story. They, I was battling between this text or that text, and they said, just tell them a story. And even being a Christian for only 18 months, I just thought, like, well, they don't need just a story. Like, it's the truth of God's word that we need. And when Jesus is telling a parable here, he's not just telling a story. There's, there's truth in it that he desires for us to take away and to benefit from. He's not teaching in parables simply to aid in understanding, but rather he's using parables to conceal the truth and obscure the meaning in order to help us long for knowing the truth and to give us the, the umph that's necessary for us to walk by faith and seek him for better understanding of his word and better application of it to our lives. A parable creates an opportunity for people to come and find out more. But that's what happens here. Jesus tells the parable, then he gets alone, and that's when, people, that's when the followers come and say, tell us what you mean. All right? We heard what you said. We know there's more there. Tell us about it. But for many, it actually creates a barrier. And that's part of the point. Parables can be deliberately obscure. Parables are a form of scripture that both reveal and conceal the mystery. And here, in this chapter, Mark records five parables for us. 
One is like a massive missile. The first one, the parable of the sower and the soils. It's large, it's detailed, followed by four that are much more machine gun-like, just psh, 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 psh. I think that's four. I want to just consider each of them with brevity as we move ultimately towards the final passage recorded for us here in Mark 4. Behold, Jesus says, that's how he begins the parable. The sower went out to sow. You notice how he sowed? Indiscriminately. No targeting. Didn't go here, didn't go there. Very unlike us sometimes. We are often guilty of sowing where we assume fertility. But not God. He sowed indiscriminately. And we see that evidenced in this parable from Jesus. No one is excluded from the seed being sown. Listen, this is God. He knows who his people are. He could go to the fourth soil type hearts and simply sow the gospel there, sow the seed there. He doesn't do that. The soil in this parable is not prejudged. It's not rated based on potential of positive responsiveness. There's no concern for hitting target groups of any sort. Target style ministry, incredibly popular in our day. It's not biblical ministry. Targeting people with influence or targeting the down and outs or targeting the rich or targeting the poor or melanin based ministry. All of these are not biblically based. Behold, Jesus said, listen to this. Behold, the sower went out to sow. No statistics were considered. No surveys were taken to see what people were interested in or what they wanted. The sower went out to sow. Some fell here, some fell there, other seed fell elsewhere. The sower went out to sow. Adniram Judson, missionary to Burma, ministered seven years when he initially went to the field before he saw a convert. He was not sowing in an area of comfort or ease. He buried four children and two wives along the way. He was not sowing in an area with great promise. He was scattering gospel seed far and wide and trusting that God would bring forth fruit. The seed that was sown across all of the types of soil was the same. Our gospel, the gospel message, ought to be the same message. No alteration depending on the type of soil. The gospel, the seed, is the constant variable in each of these scenarios. It's the gospel. It's the truth of God and his word. The soil was the variable in the equation. There are four types of hearers. Three wrong ways to hear the gospel and one right way. The three wrong ways, very briefly, the hard heart, the shallow heart, and the divided heart. The right way to hear is with a fruitful heart. The teaching of Jesus here with regard to this initial parable creates these two categories of those who understand the gospel message and the truth of Christ and those who misunderstand. But the filtering process that divides us into these different categories is not based on a thick skull, but on a hard heart. It's actually not unlike the pillar of cloud that separated the Israelites that were fleeing from the Egyptians. You remember the story, the same cloud that condemned the Egyptians protected Israel. What resulted in blindness to Egypt was light and revelation for Israel. And that's the way it is with the teachings of the gospel, particularly the parables. So Jesus says to his people, to us, keep listening and listen closely. Keep hearing and hear fully. Keep accepting and obey the truth of my word. Receive the word immediately so it's not snatched away by Satan like the first soil. Receive the word deeply so that it's not withered by persecution. Receive the word exclusively so that other concerns don't come in and strangle it out. And after this large missile of a parable, then Mark moves in to the machine gun style with 
four short pithy parables about the kingdom of God, revealing to us that though mysterious and often painfully slow, grace always grows. The grace of God always grows in the lives of his people. The first parable, the lampstand, grace grows up on top of the basket and the light shines out. The second one, the standard of measure, a greater grace is always available. We cannot deplete the infinite measures of God's grace. We come to him again and again. The seed that was cast and the grace grows miraculously. It sprouts up overnight. And then the mustard seed, the mission of grace, will be finally accomplished. The kingdom of God is unstoppable by unbelief and unhelped by human effort. And that ought to be a relief to all of God's children. Jesus here in verse 30, musing to himself, as it were, how shall we picture the kingdom of God or by what parable shall we present it? He's thinking, how can I explain? How can I encourage my people that my kingdom will last and that the gates of hell will not prevail against it? How shall we picture the kingdom of God? By what parable shall we present it? Well, we can think for a moment what exists between the small seed being sown and the mature plant. Time. We don't know how much time. But the point is this, that Jesus is making. How shall we picture the kingdom of God? Not like a hurricane. It doesn't happen all of a sudden. Not like an invading army. Not like an avalanche. Not like a swarm of bees. <coughs> Quiet and steady is the method of the kingdom. Has anyone ever planted a garden? Flower garden or vegetable garden? Did you hear any of the plants coming up? Did you see them? You would see it one day and see it the next. But unless you have time lapse, you're not watching it grow. It feels like you are day after day. Such is the kingdom of God, steady and quiet and slow. But the point is this, the end is triumphant and it is, un, and it is unquestionable. The process is not brief, it is not necessarily swift it is guaranteed not unlike Christ I mean, think about him born in a manger feeble and frail poor and unknown he appointed apostles not noblemen not educated men but fishermen tax collectors he was crucified among criminals forsaken by most of his disciples betrayed by one denied by another. Think about his beginning or even the church's beginning, insignificant and small, yet it grew. At Pentecost, growing by 3,000, another 5,000 shortly after, then at Antioch and Ephesus, and again at Corinth and Rome, widening across the West, across Europe, stretching south into Africa, eventually sailing to the new world, our world, and continues it, its expanse as the gospel is proclaimed and lives are won for Christ. The kingdom of God will continue being built and the gates of hell will not overpower it. When it is sown, verse 32, Jesus says, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and forms large branches. What is the kingdom of God like? It's victorious. And the king in that kingdom is a victorious king. His king is a triumphant kingdom. And yet with all of that, these five parables here that Mark records for us, the central theme of the kingdom is not about people's response to it. That's, that seems to be all the emphasis here in these first five parables. The parable of the soils. It's not the central theme of Christ's kingdom. Even the miraculous expanse and advance of the kingdom, that's not the central theme of Christ's kingdom. The growth and grace and development of God's people in his kingdom, that's not the central theme of Christ's kingdom. What is the central theme of the kingdom of God? The king himself. 
which is where Mark is headed after these five stories. It culminates here at the end of the chapter. The central theme of the kingdom of God is the king himself, the promised Messiah. Now, this story of Jesus stilling the sea, a familiar story, a wonderful story. I probably started learning the story around the same time that I was in RAs that Justin was mentioning earlier, Royal Ambassadors. The main thing I remember about that was learning how to make paper airplanes, but I'm sure I learned some other things. I mean, we, we can picture this story in flannel graph style, right? If we grew up in church with the pictures being thrown up on the flannel graph. But I want to consider it closely. So if you, if you can just, everything I've said by so far, it's mere introduction, okay? I'm sorry if that's bad news. On that day, verse 35, when evening came, Jesus said to them, let us go over to the other side. Don't miss that. Who initiated this venture across the lake? Jesus did. He said, after a long day of teaching, let's go to the other side. It would have been about a six or eight mile journey. Now, note this. Not only did Jesus initiate the trip in the boat with his disciples, but he also ordered the weather that evening. Right? Psalm 107, 25 for God spoke and raised up a stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. I don't think anyone else wants to. Ar- I don't think anyone wants to argue anything else that that God is somehow not in control of the weather, or that someone else is in control of the weather in any way. So Jesus initiated the trip. He ordered the weather, orchestrates the weather. He's in complete control of everything, even the storms especially the storms in your life and in mine. He is in control, initiating and orchestrating because he loves his people. And note, he doesn't merely lead us into trials. He didn't say, you all should go to the other side. I'll meet you there in the morning. We'll deal deal with the demoniac then. He doesn't send them across. He's in the boat with them. He doesn't merely lead us into trials in the same way he didn't lead them into trials. He goes with us. He leads us not into trials, but through them, walking with us, or in their case, sleeping in the boat with them. Let's now talk about the final few verses of this chapter, splitting it up into three points. The scene, verses 35 to 37, the scenario, verses 38 to 40, and the Savior, in verse 41. So the scene, the scenario, and the Savior. What is the scene? Well, we've already begun to discuss it. They are headed across the Sea of Galilee. At least four of the men on the boat were professional fishermen. They grew up fishing. They've been on the sea before. They've sailed the stormy seas. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. James and John probably even as young boys since their dad was a fisherman as well. The Sea of Galilee is not like most other seas. The surface of the sea, hard for us to fathom, is over 600 feet below sea level. So it's way down low and surrounded by mountains. It's engulfed by mountains. It's the beginning as part of the Great Rift Valley, which stretches some 4,000 miles down into eastern Africa. In fact, I've been in a volcano crater, which is now a lake, in the Great Rift Valley in Lake Babogaya in Ethiopia. The thing about the Sea of Galilee, it was very prone to storms. It was notor, the storms were notorious there. And so here they are, the followers of Jesus and Jesus on the boat headed across the sea at night. What is the scene? This is it. The servants of Christ, those that are closest to him, his friends, his followers, none of them are exempt from life's storms, from the difficulties of life. These disciples were following Jesus with their lives. They had given up everything to follow him. They loved him. They were seeking to be obedient to his commands. They they had spent day after day with him. They listened to him teach. They watched him heal. And yet, 
even they are not spared the danger and trouble of the sea. Do we not respond with shock and sometimes even disgust when we are forced to face difficulties in life? Yet the promise is here on the pages of Scripture. Though we follow Christ, we might say especially because we follow Christ, we will face difficulties. Trusting in Christ does not guarantee that our journey to heaven will be smooth and easy. There are things promised as a result of us following Christ. Free pardon from all our sin, guaranteed. Full forgiveness, absolutely guaranteed. Grace, abundant, marvelous grace all along the way, guaranteed. Glory and bliss for all of eternity, guaranteed and promised. But not a cool breeze and smooth seas. That's not promised. Peter, being on the boat that evening, learned storm theology very well. He writes in 1 Peter 4, some probably two to three decades after this event. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you. We can almost hear Peter saying, like I was that night when the fierce gale came up, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. Peter is teaching from his own experience. I was surprised. I didn't know what was happening. Please don't do that, friends. But, he says, to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exultation. The storms of life, the difficulties that we face are what God uses to wean us from our infatuation with the world. The difficulties that we face reveal our weaknesses and our need of Him. Remember, He initiated the journey. He orchestrated the weather in order that the troubles of our life would purify our affections for Christ and make us long for heaven. John Newton, the famous hymn writer, probably most well known for writing Amazing Grace. He knew difficulties on the sea. He knew difficulties in the Christian life. In one of his lesser known hymns, I ask the Lord that I might grow in faith and love and every grace, might more of his salvation know and seek more earnestly his face. So far, so good. Twas he who taught me thus to pray, and he I trust has answered prayer. But, Newton continues, it has been in such a way as almost drove me to despair. Why, we might ask Newton. Well, he continues, I hoped that in some favored hour, at once he'd answer my request. Isn't that how we always want it? Right now, our way, right away. And by his love's constraining power, subdue my sins and give me rest. Instead of this, Newton continues, he made me feel the hidden evils of my heart and let the angry powers of hell assault my soul in every part. Yea, more with his own hand, he seemed intent to aggravate my woe. Crossed all the fair designs I schemed, blasted my gourds, humbled my heart, and laid me low. Lord, why is this? I trembling cried, wilt thou pursue thy worm to death? Tis in this way, the Lord replied, I answer prayer for grace and faith. These inward trials I employ from self and pride to set thee free and break thy schemes of earthly joy that thou mayest find thy all in me. The same is true for us, it's true for Newton. We do desire that we might grow in faith and love and every grace and more of his salvation know and seek more earnestly his faith. But he is initiating the journey of our life and orchestrating the storms of our life in order that we might be free from self and pride and sin and earthly joy that we may find our all in him. There arose, verse 37, a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. In Matthew's account of this, he actually calls it a seaquake, where we get the word seismic, how we measure earthquakes. It was 
quite likely an earthquake that caused it all to happen that day. These aren't, when we think about being out on a lake, most of us have probably, probably been boating at some point. It's hard for us to imagine what the storm would have been like. But it's a unique sea in a unique position. In fact, in 1992, which was high school for me, and most of you weren't born, at least many of you, Waves on the Sea of Galilee were recorded at 10 feet. That's massive. Just imagine sitting in a boat where you are right now. Eight foot ceilings, another two feet of waves coming crashing down on a fishing boat that's made to hold a dozen and a half tops. Notice the suddenness of the storm. There arose a fierce gale. Is this not how life happens? I mean, there's a saying, life comes at you fast. You know what comes even faster? Difficulties. <laughs> the difficult part of life comes much faster. Has anyone ever gotten a memo that next week or next month or just around the corner, you're going to have a real difficult time? There's going to be a real trial. No. You get there and boom, you're hit with it smashed with the wave that comes crashing, comes crashing in. Christians since the very beginning of time have faced trials and learned the benefit of them. We see that in Newton's hymn. Even in the hymn that we sang earlier, who holds our faith when fears arise, who stands above the stormy trial, who sends the waves that bring us nigh unto the shore, the rock of Christ, God is completely in control. The line from that hymn reminds me of the very familiar quote from Spurgeon. I've learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. Because we need him. Coming forward even more into our present day, I've quoted some old guys. Casting crowns. Praise you in this storm. I was sure by now, some of you are going to be familiar with this song. I was sure by now, God, you would have reached down and wiped our tears away, stepped in and saved the day. But once again, I say, amen. And it's still raining. As the thunder rolls, I barely hear you whisper through the rain. I'm with you. And as your mercy falls, I raise my hands and praise the God who gives and takes away. And every tear I've cried, you hold in your hand. You never left my side. And though my heart is torn, I'll praise you in this storm. And I'll lift my hands. Here's the key to it all. For you are who you are, no matter where I am. He is the unchanging reality. Initiating the journey orchestrating the storm for our good. That's the scene. Let's consider the scenario, picking up in verse 38. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not a terrible situation. Waves are breaking over the boat. The boat's already filling up. But yeah, I mean, there's buckets on the boat. We can throw some water out. But Jesus is asleep, verse 38. So the scenario is the storm is going on and Jesus is asleep. Look at verse 38. Jesus himself was in the stern asleep on the cushion. Does it make you scratch your head a little bit? Jesus is using a cushion? Why is he using a cushion? Because it's more comfortable. It's not difficult to figure out. It's a trick question. Yeah, Jesus is not an ascetic who refuses all creature comforts. He's fully human, truly human. And if he's not, we have no savior. Amen. Following a long day of ministry, of teaching, he's tired. What do tired humans do? They sleep. He's exhausted from ministry. But you know what else? Why he can sleep in the stern in the midst of the storm? Because he's fully trusting of his heavenly father. 
This is the only mention of Jesus ever sleeping. We, we know he didn't have a place to lay his head. This is, he, he's actually sleeping here. And it's during a storm. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. His father is your father if you're in him. And so we can sleep in the stormiest aspect of our lives. When difficulties are mounting, when anxieties are welling up, we can pull up a pillow and sleep because our Heavenly Father does not. Second half of verse 38 begins a series of three questions. The first question, do not care that we're perishing. The second question, from Jesus back to them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And the third question from the disciples to themselves, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? But for now, just that first question. Again, don't lose the reality of the situation. Long day of teaching. They've heard parables. They understand some of it. They don't understand other parts of it. Jesus gets in the boat. They head across. Now... There's wind and there are waves like they've never seen before. They are fearing an imminent death. They wake Jesus up and say, do you not care that we're perishing? I mean, waking Jesus is understandable. It's expected. But accusing Jesus of not caring? It's absurdity. He had given up eternal glory because he cared for them. He had given up being at the right hand of the Father. You know why? Because he cared for them. He had taken on humanity, frail humanity like ours, because he cared for them. He had left the praises of the angels because he cared for them. He was despised and rejected by men because he cared for them. And they wake him up and say, do you not care that we're perishing? It's interesting to note that in Gethsemane, three of these disciples would find themselves sleeping on the eve of Christ's death. You know what he didn't say to them? Do you not care that I'm about to perish? Why not wake Jesus earlier? Well, we're prone to be just like the disciples here, relying on our own strength as long as possible. I think I've seen a billboard, bumper sticker, t-shirt, maybe all of them. If all else fails, read the instructions. We are so prone to not trust in the Lord with all our heart and to lean on our own understanding, and to not acknowledge Him. We should trust in Him first. Not taking the buckets on board and trying to dump all the water out and finally, as a last-ditch effort, wake Him up and assume that He doesn't care just because He has the capacity to rest in the arms of His Heavenly Father. The right response would be to trust in the Lord with our whole heart, not leaning in our own understanding that is tainted by sin and to acknowledge him in all our ways in order that he will make our paths straight. Jesus got up and rebuked the wind. This is completely different from how I would respond. I don't know about you, but I would have rebuked them first. Why are you waking me up? Do you not know who I am? You're accusing me of not caring? But Jesus gets up, rebukes the wind, says to the sea, hush, be still. The wind died down, became perfectly calm. This is fascinating to me. Think about how the storm works. The wind's blowing, the waves are going. He can say hush to the wind. And if you wait a little while without the wind blowing, what else is going to happen? The waves are going to cease. Slowly but surely, it'll stop rocking. But Jesus doesn't wait on that to happen. He commands an immediate cease. Be still. It's as if he's pressing down into a still sea of glass. The voice of the one who created the wind, who created the waves, and who ordered them on this night can also calm them with a word, hush, be still. I mentioned Psalm 107 earlier. Listen to the rest of that passage. For he spoke and raised up a stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They rose up. Let, 
in our minds, let's get into the boat with the disciples. Right? They rose up to the heavens. They went down to the depths. Their soul melted away in their misery. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wits end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he brought them out of their distresses. He caused the storm to be still so that the waves of the sea were hushed. That sounds like commentary on Mark chapter 4, recorded in Psalm 107, verse 25 through 29. Silence and stillness resulted from Jesus' words, hush, be still. The hymn writer captured it so well. Be still, my soul, thy God doth undertake to guide thee future as he has the past. Thy hope, thy confidence, let nothing shake. All now mysterious shall be bright at last. Be still, my soul. The wind and waves still know his voice who ruled them while he dwelt below. Surely we will not be outdone by the wind and the waves remembering his powerful voice. And Jesus responds to them now. Having dealt with the wind and the waves, he turns to his disciples with a gentle rebuke in the form of an interrogative. Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Why are you afraid? The wind and the waves were not the only thing out of order that night. They were not the only thing experiencing chaos as a result of the circumstances at hand. When Jesus says there, why are you afraid? He's literally saying, why are you cowering in fear? Why are you acting like cowards? Jesus says, why? He's so patient with his disciples. He is the king of the universe. And yet he shows remarkable kindness to all of his subjects. He makes no threat here of casting them off. He doesn't mention disgust with regard to their fearfulness. Rather, he bears with them, raising them from their fear restoring their faith, reminding them of what they've seen, what they've heard, and who he is, who they are in him. Christ intends to calm their fears the way that he calmed the wind and the waves. Hush, be still. We could use a dose of this kind of patience that Christ exhibits with his disciples when dealing with others. Some of us could use a dose of this kind of patience when we deal with ourselves. It is terribly unfortunate, but all too common when we're harder on ourselves than Christ is on us. The way that he deals with fearful, cowardly disciples is encouraging here. He wants to instill faith, remove fear and instill faith. Our fearfulness is directly related to our lack of faith. Faithlessness in our lives results in us being fearful. Which brings us to the final point. We have the scene, the scenario, and finally the Savior. Which is the final question as well. They became, look at verse 41. The disciples became very much afraid. Very much. Mega, mega phobia. Literally, in the original. That's what they're experiencing. But the wind has died down. And the sea is settled. Why? They're more afraid after the storm is settled than while it was swirling around them. Because they haven't grasped the reality that Greater is he that is for us than those who are against us. The wind and the waves were not their major issue that night on the sea. The major issue that they needed to deal with was the presence of the king. And the same is true for us. Our primary issues in life are not the situations that we find ourselves in. The primary issue in our life is this man, this Christ, this king with whom we have to do. Everything around them was made peaceful and perfect. 
yet now they are massively more fearful. <clears throat> My biggest problem, your biggest problem, is not the turmoil circling our lives. The biggest issue in our life is what we think about this man, this king who is Christ. When fears are swirling around, when anxieties are surging within, we're failing to fear him. Failing to fear him who loves us with an everlasting love. Failing to fear him who will never leave us or forsake us. Failing to fear him who cares for us. Failing to fear him who came to save us, who suffered for us, who bled and died for us, Failing to fear him who was raised again for us, who is seated at the right hand of God for us. Failing to fear him who intercedes for us, who is sustaining us and all things by the word of his power. Failing to fear him who will one day return for us. Who then is this man that even the wind and the sea obey him? If they had begun their journey with this level of faith-producing fear, they would not have responded so wrongly when the storm began. A greater fear of Christ, the King, is the solution to settling the stormy seas of our lives. Not exclaiming that Christ doesn't care, which is where they started, but by trusting that He cares and crying out to Him and believing Him that he does care and that he does calm. So what about for us? What, what's your storm? What's swirling around? Consuming your mind and your heart, distracting your life. At the end of the day, most storms are measured by loss. It could be loss of friends due to change of location or circumstance. For some, a loss of a loved one through sickness or death. Loss of a job, loss of career, loss of hope. For the disciples on this night, they lost the ability to be in control. They feared losing their own lives. But no matter the storm, no matter how large, no matter how small, Christ controls it, all of it, every aspect of it, when it begins and when it ends. He initiated the journey, he orchestrated the weather. He determines how hard the wind blows in your life. He determines how hard the waves crash in on your life. May he help us to begin every journey, our journey, each day, each moment, with the right question, who then is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Look back at verse 36 briefly. Leaving the crowd, they took Jesus along with them in the boat, just as he was. And then this phrase, wonderfully intriguing. And other boats were with him. They were not the only boat on the sea that night. Consider those other boats for just a moment. How they benefited from being close to Christ. They traveled on the night that Christ was on the water. From being close to Christ and to his people. And now do this for me. Look at what was said about those other boats. Nothing. Nothing else was even mentioned. Oh, that we would worry less about all the other boats out there and how they're handling the storms of life. And that we ourselves would be enamored with Christ being at the stern, in the stern, at the helm. That we would be content with the Savior in our boat. The prophet Isaiah writes the uproar of many peoples who roar like the roaring of the seas and the rumbling of nations who rush on like the rumbling of mighty waters. Time and again throughout the scriptures, the rumbling of waters is a picture 
of sin and wickedness. Even Isaiah 57, the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up refuse and mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. But contrast that with Revelation 4. A throne was standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, ceaseless worship is happening. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and because of your will they existed and were created. This is the King, Christ our King, and He is kind in His initiating every aspect of our life and orchestrating every aspect of our life. His kindness is revealed. His love for us is manifested. May we revel in that reality and seek to honor Him with the entirety of our lives. Let's pray in closing. God, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would take the truth as it is in Jesus and apply it to our hearts and our lives, that you would give us a grace to make room to be obedient to you in all things. God, we thank you that you've sent your son, Christ, who is king, and you've shown eternal kindnesses toward us. You've shown covenant mercies toward us as your people. You've shown amazing grace. You've shown unending love. God, help us to live with those realities on the forefront of our mind, that the song on our lips might be that new song of redemption and forgiveness through Christ our King. We pray in his name. Amen.